tape number five of an interview with Sabina Winter. Mrs Winter, can you please introduce your family? I'll start with my daughter-in-law. It's Mary. And then is Gideon. Noam. And Sari is my youngest. And Orit. That's the youngest from my daughter. The others are from my son. Can I just ask one of the grandchildren um, if you're aware of your grandmother's experiences when you were growing up? Was it ever talked about at home or by your grandmother? I don't really remember as, as a young child hearing all that much. Um, although, nothing personal, although I do recall at about the age of 10, um, on one Yom HaShoah evening when my parents were out at the, the communal, um, I don't have a clue what it's called, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's what on I heard, the, I think that's Yom what I heard HaShoah. about, on Yom HaShoah, yeah, that was probably the first time, about 10 or 12, right, that I heard some, that my grandmother you. spoke, yeah. Does anyone else want to add anything? Anyone done a project on, on the Holocaust or anything like that? I think you did, Gidon. Yeah. yeah, I also did one. Um, I did one in year seven. I basically did it on all the grandparents. I found out all my grandparents' stories. And, well, I think it was something that I needed to know, and now I feel better knowing that. And how did it affect you hearing about what they had been through? Well, I didn't really go into it in depth. I basically did a basic summary and it was also mainly talking about their life once they moved to Australia. So I really didn't concentrate on her, on the events that occurred during the Holocaust. Anyone did you make a project, Sari? Mm -hmm. No? What about you, Ori? No. Do you know anything about Bubba? Hmm? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mrs. Winter, can you please introduce your family? Yes, this is A.B., my son, A.B. Winter, and this is Adele, my daughter. Can I just ask one or both of you, were you aware of your, or your parents' experiences as you were growing up? Yes. In what way did that come about? Um, well, we, we'd been told, um, even as, as young children, about the Holocaust. We were aware that um, my mother was in a concentration camp and the dad had served in the Polish army and then that he'd uh, been a prisoner of war in Russia. Um, and various episodes that occurred with him, some of his friends. Um, and. Mum, a lot of some of Mum's closest friends are her um, Lagerschwester, her fellow concentration camp workers. Sisters, concentration sisters, camp right. sisters. Yep. Okay. Right. And have your parents' experiences influenced the way you've brought up your own children? Definitely. Right. It wasn't even just that. I can remember uh, being as young as five and saying to my mother very angrily, "Why didn't I have grandparents?" because I was best friends with a girl across the road who was Australian, I mean, Karen, uh, Karen, yeah, Karen Ambrose, and she had these lovely grandparents. And um, my mother, you know, at the age of five, started telling me that, well, you know, there were Nazis and our grandparents all died in concentration camps and I couldn't really understand what any of that was. But I just remember running across the road, really upset, to Karen and saying, asking her if she thought her grandparents would let me adopt them because I was really miserable about it, that I didn't have grandparents. And um, right I through, I've been acutely aware of everything that both my parents went through, probably more mum, because she's opened up more, and there've been flashes of things. I can remember once going on a train trip with my mother, and we went during the day on a train to Mildura, and mum said, for the way back, let's fly. We couldn't get a flight back, we were there in Middle Jura for a few days. So I said to Mum, what about a sleeper to come back? And Mum was a bit hesitant. I didn't know why. And then she said, OK. The minute the lights went out, we turned the lights out and it was like two bunks. 
and I immediately thought mum would want the lower bunk being older and you know and I was young and I could go and climb up and she said no no I want the top bunk and she was crying all night she didn't get a night's sleep the whole night was very comfortable she couldn't sleep but reminded her of the train that obviously took her from um, the ghetto that she'd been in no, away from it the reminded place. me not the train. The, when I used to sleep down on the bank, down as I said before, in the concentration camp, and somebody was sleeping above, above, you. above me. And did she explain? Yeah, yeah. And then I got really upset with myself for having been so stupid as to say, "Well, let's take the night train home." I mean, to me, it seemed logical. Get a good night's sleep, coming home, and it hit me. You know, I knew my mother's experience, but you just don't put a particular detail of the experience together with what could remind, what could bring on a lot of pain. I mean, you obviously would want to avoid it if you could. And, and in what way has it affected, you know, the way you've brought up your own children? Has there been anything specific or just...? Yeah. Well, this year I, Mum knows, I kicked up a fuss. Um, they'd been on school holidays and Yom HaShoah was their first day back at school, at my daughter's Jewish school. and. Um, the night before, I'd taken her for the first time to the Warsaw Ghetto Commemoration Evening at Robert Blackwood Hall. And I was talking to her a little bit about it in a way that a seven-year-old could understand. And um, I said, and I'm sure tomorrow at school you'll be talking about it. I said about concentration camp or the Second World War, Hitler. I mentioned all sorts of different names. She came home that day and she said, we didn't talk about it at all. And I said, oh, well, maybe later on in the week. Later on in the week, they had an um, um, assembly to commemorate Rosh Chodesh, Iyar, and also a, a, a Rebbe whose uh, birthday it was. And then she sort of said, well, you know, this is obviously more important, but that's what we had the assembly about. It wasn't about Yom HaShoah, Mummy. And we were sitting at the table, Shabbos, Friday night when she said that, and I just said, this can't, I can't leave it. I've got to say something to the school, and I wrote a very emotional letter to the headmistress who called me in and you know she sprang me and she actually apologised and she said that um, that had a lot of um, very angry complaints from parents in previous years that children this age shouldn't learn about the Shoah. That they made it compulsory from grade three but my daughter's in grade two so that was why there was a conscious decision made not to talk about the Shoah with these kids because they're too little and I just said I'm sorry. There's a way you can talk about it with, with little kids and they've got to know. You know, we're not talking about a one or two or even a three-year-old, we're talking about seven-year-olds. And, and sure, you don't go into gross details, but there's a way. And I've sat with her and I've already given her a book to read that my mother bought actually in Israel. Um, and she's read it a couple of times and she's asked me questions when she hasn't understood something. So she actually does already at seven have a bit of knowledge that hopefully will expand as she gets older. But I think it's really important. Anything anyone else wants to um, I'm not sure that I've emphasised it. I mean, my kids are aware of it. They get it at school. We have a number of books on it at home. They didn't As talk about it here. They didn't want to say a word. Didn't they? No. no. Well, Gidon, Gidon actually... said that he doesn't know anything. That's Wait, what Gidon they said. Went to that the, about Bupa what? didn't tell him anything. Yeah. I didn't say anything. Noam said... Uh, about the project he did. He did a project, in his but he did it um, mostly when they came to Australia. The grandparents. The grandparents. Um, all four. He wrote, Gidon wrote a poem about it actually in year nine, I think. And Noam did it in year eight or nine. They'd both done work. Um, they both were of them, shy. Yeah, both of them. And, and not only that, um, Gino has been going to the Warsaw Ghetto Commemoration probably since he was in Year 7 at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, and both of them went with me this year. Um, Gino even brought me back a book from Israel about uh, the Holocaust, at about, uh, or maybe it was about Jewish persecution through the ages, I'm not quite sure, written by Martin Gilbert. Um, we've got a couple of other books of his at home as well. Um, but. I think that there was one that you sent me actually from Israel, but he brought me back one as well, uh, which he bought for my birthday and, and uh, brought it back when he came back at the beginning of this year. Um, all my kids have been to Yad Vashem because we were in Israel um, three years ago now, 
and uh, we actually went to the ceremony in the evening um, at Yomashoa that was there we were, uh, and after that the museum was thrown open for people to go and visit and uh, we spent two hours going through the museum after that uh, and the three, the three children and myself had been through a couple of days previously anyway so we'd been to the the children's museum we'd been to the um, the children's art well the art museum the art of the holocaust as well and we hadn't managed because we were pressed for time because my son had to go off somewhere that afternoon we hadn't managed to go through the actual museum part in such detail so we had the opportunity to spend a couple of hours going through it again um, so um, you know my kids have been exposed to it um, they've heard various stories bits and pieces coming through in dribs and drabs from both sets of grandparents but they haven't actually had the grandparents sit down and talk to them for a few hours about their recollection Th things come up every now and then um, I mean they're aware that dad was in Russia they're aware of what he went through they know he had typhus you don't even ask me last night I, I can't I don't, I, I don't know I don't remember under what context but how come um, we were named Winter rather than Witwornik which is our cousin's name mm -hmm. and um, how come dad came to change it and he knew it was my mother, my grandmother's maiden mm -hmm. name and I explained the circumstances to him so I mean my kids I, I don't know why they didn't want to talk earlier but uh, they may have just been rushed or whatever uh, but they are aware of what went on. They're acutely aware of, of um, the events that occurred during the Holocaust. Um, they do hear about it at school. Um, there is a, uh, a ceremony on Warsaw Ghetto Commemoration Day each year at, at uh, the school they go to. Do you want me to, can I name the school? Or uh, My kids yeah, all go to Libra Yavna and um, they, always, they always have a speaker who's a survivor usually. And they have a special program uh, based on, on the Holocaust uh, on that particular day. And should it occur during the school holidays, then they usually have an assembly first or second day back where it's discussed, again with a guest speaker. So they're, um, aware. So they're aware. And, and uh, the boys both go to youth, youth movements and they also have um, uh, speakers at the youth movement as well. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Okay. This is a continuation of tape num number five of an interview with Sabina Winter. Um, we've, we're continuing now with the story as we had to break um, for two lots of photo, uh, video with the family. Okay. At the end of the, or when we were talking before, you, we were talking about you coming to Australia. So can you please tell me about your dr journey to Australia? We came with the Serenia. We left um, Fiat, I think, in May. Which year? 51. And we, we, we were in Italy waiting for the ship, and my son got sick. And he was so sick that we couldn't go with the boat. And we had to wait for six weeks for the next boat. And um, I remember he had long curly hair. And I, one day I went uh, for an excursion to look around in Toronto, at, at, at to Torun, Torun. And uh, I went. Uh, for an excursion, and I came back, and uh, a child was running towards me, and I didn't recognize him. During that time, my husband cut his curls, <laughs> and I thought that was a st I, I didn't recognize my own child. And then we came here with the next boat, and we had a storm, and it was a terrible journey. Terrible. It was a very big storm on the way. What was the name of that boat? Also Serenia. Serenia. Serenia, yes. And um, uh, my husband's friend was waiting for us and we went into his place 
and we stayed for a few weeks there until we found a room, some in Northcourt. What were and your my husband was working. He, he, that friend took my husband uh, for an exam. And he, my husband was a hairdresser, and um, he took him for an exam, and uh, he couldn't speak English. And, but he passed the exam and he got a job in Northcourt. What were your first impressions of Australia? Of I Melbourne? wanted to try to go back. Why was that? Because it was so quiet. I couldn't speak the language. I didn't know anybody except that friend. And uh, there was hardly any people there. And nobody wanted to give us uh, a dwelling. We couldn't get a dwelling because I had a child. With a child, that was impossible to get something. Anyhow, through <coughs> Protexia, uh, we found that room. And we had one room, and we could use the kitchen when they went to work, the people. And we were living there for a year. And that, that place where my husband was working, uh, the, the owner was a Scotch, and he wanted to go back to Scotland. And he sold that uh, business to my husband. During that year, my husband went to school, and he learned the language in the evenings. And we met very, very nice people by the name of Friedlander and they borrowed us money to buy the business, and we paid them off. And uh, once we start in the business, things, and then uh, in that business, there was a dwelling behind the shop, and we lived behind the shop there. And uh, I was working, I was behind the counter. Not that I could speak English, but I was working. People helped me. The Australian people were very helpful. And uh, we made a good living. We paid off what we owed. And uh, from there, we went further. We bought a house later on, after a few years. We lived in Preston. And that was it. That was how we settled in Australia. My husband loved it here. He loved it. He didn't want to hear when I was crying in the beginning. He went to work, and I was all by myself with that little boy. I couldn't stand the heat, and I couldn't speak. I, didn't ha I, I, I couldn't go to school because it was important for my husband to learn English, not for me. And how did you learn English in the end? Did I you? didn't. I just picked it up. After from the children, I, I started, when the children went to school, I, I learned from them. How would you describe Jewish life here? Was oh, now it's full, but no, no, not when, when we came. When you first arrived? No, there was no, no Jewish. Look, I didn't know anybody. That The people who brought us out, they didn't... Um, they went religious, they went even traditional. There was no holidays, nothing was. And I was very upset and because I couldn't, I couldn't keep on what I started in Germany. And when, I, when we shifted to Nordcourt, there was quite a big Jewish community there, quite a few people who also were in concentration camp, and they told me where I could buy kosher meat and so on, and that's how I started. Right. Did you mix with other survivors? Yes, we yeah. did, yeah. Right. Oh, the, the, the only, we mix only with other survivors. Okay. Or people. Uh, well, the people who were in Russia were also survivors. You can call them survivors as well. So not only concentration people. We mix only with, with survivors, not with the, with the people who lived there from before the war. How did your Holocaust experiences affect your transition into post-war life? What effect 
did your experiences have in your new, you know, your move to look, Australia? Look, it affected me that I didn't have anybody whom to go to ask for advice. You know, at 23 or 4 or 5 years old, still uh, need some advice from her parents. I didn't have any help from anybody. I didn't go out when I have a small child. I didn't have where to leave my child, with whom to live. Wherever we went, we took our child with us. And so it was hard. The beginning in every country is the beginning hard. But my husband always said that this is the best country to be in, to start a new life. Right. And tell me about more of your family. When was your daughter born? Well, when was my daughter born? My son was born in Germany. My daughter was born. There is six years in between them. So when was she born? No, no, 50, 50, she's 42. Yes. So you were already in Australia for a few years? Yeah, you you were. Oh. I didn't want to have any children straight away because I couldn't. Uh, I had to help my husband and the boy was still little. And uh, so he was six years old when, when yeah. Adele was born. Okay. What, um, what do you remember okay. most about your experiences? Is there anything that stands out or... Here? Or in general, about your life experiences, your war experiences? Everything stands out. You don't forget those things. They live with you. Even you try, push it away. It stays there, it's inside, but you don't talk about it. So what made you tell your story today? My children. I, uh, I told my children when I was young I, and when they were young. As you heard before, I used to tell them a little bit here and a little bit there. And a little. They knew always that I was in concentration camp. And um, when they got a little bit older, seven or eight, I took them to the, I remember it used to be in, in Melbourne Town Hall, the Shoah. And um, I used to take them always, wherever I went. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want them to forget it. So what is the message or lesson you'd like to pass on to your children and grandchildren? To my children and to my grandchildren, never to forget what my generation went through. Not personally, I went through. What my generation went through. Never to forget the family what we lost. I never had an uncle, auntie, or the, or after the war, I didn't have anybody. And to stay a bench all day life, that's, that's is the most important thing. And to listen, sometimes to sit down and listen to that type that they know really what happened. Because the children of today and the grandchildren, they don't know what it means to be hungry or what it means not to have this or that, to go out without it. You know, I don't think that the children of today, I don't mean my children, I mean in general children, the children are spoiled because they, they don't lack of anything, you see, that they got everything and they, they don't appreciate what they have because they don't know any other way. 
You can tell them the stories, you can read the books, but if you don't go through it, you don't really know what it means. What it means to be alone, what it means not to belong, what it means to, 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 to lose everything and to be as you say in Yiddish, nakit and barves, I don't know how to uh, say it in English, like, like God created you. They don't know it. And I hope they won't need to know it. I pray and hope to God that they will never need to know things like that. But you know, things going on in, in this world still, people are hungry. Many people are hungry and starved. We, I don't think the world has learned a lesson. I don't think so. But we trying, let's say, to leave, leave a legacy and to tell our children and to bring up their children to remember what it happened and never to forget. Is there anything you'd like to add to any part of this tape? I don't think that uh, I don't think that I can do it right now. I'm I'm worn out. You know, all all those memories. They take a lot out of me. I think of everybody. I did it for my family, for my grandparents, for my, for my parents, for my grandparents, for my uncles and aunties and cousins who can't speak for themselves and they haven't got a grave. And we don't know where they perished. I did it for them because they can't speak anymore. Not for myself and not so, so much for my children. I did it for them. I'd like to thank you very much for telling, you, telling me your story today. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Photograph. There is my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunties and uncles, my mother, my father, my brother, and my sister. Can you please tell me when this photograph was taken approximately? Uh, 37. Right. And where was it taken? In Khshanov, at my grandfather's place. Right. And, and I found it after the war on the attic okay. in, in, uh, at home, in Wadowice. Thank you. Can you please point yourself out in this photograph? Tell us where it is, where you are. I am on the second row, the second from the back. Right, okay. And your parents? And my mother is the first one in front row, mm -hmm. in the front row. And my father is the last one in the back row. And my little brother is on, in the first row with my father and my sister is sitting next to my auntie. Okay, thank you. Okay. This is tape number six of an interview with Sabina Winter. Mrs. Winter, can you please tell me who is in this photograph? In this photograph is my husband's parents and uh, grandfather and uh, his aunties. Okay. Can you tell me when this photograph was taken approximately? Where it was taken? In Plotsk. Right. In Plotsk. Mm -hmm. And how did you get to obtain this photograph? Uh, this uncle was in London and he sent this to my, 
to my husband okay. from London. Thank you. Can you please tell me what this is a photograph of? That photograph is of a Jewish school, Beis Yaakov, where I used to go every afternoon for three hours. And are you in this photograph? I, I am on the top row, the sixth one, and my sister is the fifth one on the bottom row. Do you know approximately what year this photograph was taken? No. And where? Mm -hmm. It was taken in Vadovice. Right. And how did you obtain this photograph? From Israel, from a friend of mine mm -hmm. who lived through the war. Thank you. Can you please tell me who's in this photograph? Uh, myself and my sister. Which one and are you? I'm on the what? Right? Left? Left. Left? Right. Okay. And my sister is uh, on the right. And when was this photograph taken, approximately? Uh, uh, during the war, when we came back uh, to Vadovice. Mm -hmm. It was taken in 1939, and at the end of, 19, well, maybe not quite at the end because I'm looking at the sleeves. It must have been still warm. And how did you obtain this photograph? The, this photograph I found at the attic, in, in my house. Thank you. Who is this a photograph of? This is a photograph from my mother. When uh, was it? Uh, just before she got married. Mm -hmm. That was taken. Where was it? In Chanov. And how did you? In Poland. Chanov, Poland. And how did you? I also found it at the attic. Okay. Thank you. And this is a photograph from my sister. I found it at the attic as well, between the other photos. Do you know approximately when it was taken? No. 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 Thank you. Who was in this photograph? That was me and my husband when we were married. And when was that? February the 12th, 1946. And where was this taken? Where were you married? We were married in Fir Germany. Uh, no, in Fern Fernwald, Germany. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you tell me what this is a photograph of? This is a plaque for the Jews and for the, who died in Vadovice and for the synagogue and by Smedrish, what was built, what was um, this, this stored, uh, stayed in, in 1939. That was the first time when the German came in, that was the first thing what they did, they burned the synagogue and the shul. And where is this plaque laid? The plaque they built a kindergarten, the Poles built a kindergarten in that place and uh, it was put up in the same place on, on, on the where you go into that kinder, kindergarten that was put up there mm -hmm. in Vadovice. Right. And how did you obtain this photograph? I was in Israel two years ago and I, they gave it to me. Uh, people from where I belong. I belong to the Vadovice Society and uh, they gave it to me. Okay, thank you. Who is in this photograph? This is myself and my husband. This is my last photo before my husband passed away. When was it taken? In December. Which year do you remember? 1990. Okay. And okay. he passed away in 1991. Thank you. 
can you please tell me what, what this is? They are prayer books. When I came back um, after the war to my home, to Poland, I found them at the ethics. And the top two books I used to go, I used at school. I was uh, learning from them at school by Ziarkov. Thank you. And I brought them with me to Australia. What is that? How you call that? That. How do you call it? Can you please tell me what these items are? There is a spoon, what I found, and a menorah, what I found at the attic. And um, that menorah actually belonged to my parents. It was and, and the spoon. And there is a little goblet, uh, what my parents gave a, a set of six as a present to the wedding from my uncle. And when I was in Israel, my cousin gave it to me. She gave me one. She has left herself one. And she gave to each f from the family members one. That's all what it was left after the war. Thank you very much.